All right, g'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for another trade related video, but this time rather than focusing on what's happening right now, I thought it'd be interesting to take a look back at last year's trade period and look at some of the more high profile recruits and trades and doing a bit of an assessment 12 months after the fact. Now, obviously, it's only 12 months after these trades took place. So for a lot of cases, it's probably still too early to come up with a decisive outcome on who won this trade, who did better. But it is still interesting to take a look at where things sit 12 months on. In this video, I'm not going to go through absolutely every trade that went down. That's uh, There's far too much going on for that. But I'll just rattle through some of the more high-profile ones in no particular order. And we can take a little look uh, with the benefit of hindsight as to how these trades are shaping up. The good thing is we can look at some of the draft picks that were taken with those trades. And after 12 months, we've got a little bit of an idea of what kind of player those teams were able to pick up with the draft picks that they acquired. Before we crack on with the video, I'd appreciate it if you guys could consider subscribing to this channel if you haven't already, whether whether you've just discovered me recently or if you've been a long time watcher but haven't actually hit subscribe it would mean a lot to me if you would consider doing that this is going to be a fairly busy time in terms of content I'm going to be trying my best to cover all the trade period action as it takes place so if that's the sort of stuff you're interested in hitting subscribe would help you keep up with all of this trade content anyways let's crack into it the first trade I'm going to look at is one of the maybe not high profile trades from last year talking about Peter Wright who joined the Essendon footy club from the Gold Coast Suns uh, for just a 2021 fourth round pick. So at the time, it was a future fourth rounder. And this one probably certainly raised a few eyebrows because he's a former top 10 pick at the Gold Coast Suns. But because this was a bit of a salary dump for them, they went through this issue of maybe over-contracting and overpaying a few of their high-profile draft picks. And it kind of led to this awkward situation where they're a little bit closer to the salary cap than they would really like, especially for a team low down on the ladder. But we'll get into the trade. Peter Wright had a pretty good year, I would say. He only kicked one goal in the first five rounds but going off the stats he definitely was doing a lot more rucking than when he ended the season he did kick 29 goals from 21 games 13 of which were in the final month of the home and away season and of course that big seven goal haul helped Essendon actually qualify for the finals because that was the game they upset the Bulldogs interestingly it wasn't actually his highest goal tally he did notch I think 31 in one of his first few seasons at the Gold Coast Suns but I think there's no doubt he's showing signs of improvement and like I said for a future fourth round pick and this player helped them qualify for the finals and on top of that is hopefully going to be a longer term prospect for them they've definitely done very well from Gold Coast perspective um, in the ruck they had no Jared Witts this year due to an ACL and they also made a bit of a play for Callum Coleman Jones I don't know if they're going to be successful with that particular venture but either way both rucks and key forwards remain a little bit of a need for Gold Coast so even though it was a salary dump which I understand this trade has worked out very very well for Essendon keeping on with the Essendon theme we'll now take a look at Adam Saad who was traded along with pick 48 and 78 to Carlton for picks 8 and 87. He may not have really set the world on fire in his first year at Carlton, but I don't think he was too poor either. I think it's fair to suggest he probably didn't have the same impact that Carlton were hoping for when they offloaded a top 8 pick for him, but he's nowhere near a bust. I think he's still a very good player, and he's 27 years old, so he's still in the right sort of age bracket for Carlton to need him over the next 3 or 4 years as they try and climb closer to the finals. From Essendon's perspective, I thought this was the biggest blow out of the 3 players they lost, but the pick that they got for Adam Saad helped them acquire Nick Cox, who is one of the brightest young talents from that draft so far. So at the moment, I think both sides will be fairly comfortable with this trade because I still think Adam Saad has plenty to offer and Nick Cox could frankly be anything. Next, we'll talk about Aaliyah Aaliyah, who was traded for a second rounder this year from the Sydney Swans. And I think this one speaks for itself. He was an All-Australian centre-half back this year, ranked third in intercepts. Port Adelaide made out like absolute bandits here. There's not too much analysis needed. It is fair to suggest that Aaliyah Aaliyah wasn't this sort of level of player when Sydney traded him, but they definitely got unders for a very, very good footballer. Next, we'll talk about Ben Brown, who was traded from North Melbourne to Melbourne, along with pick 28 and a fourth round of this year, and they received 26 and 33. So other than a two-pick upgrade, it more or less became pick 33 that they got him for. From what I can tell, North actually traded that 26 anyway, so it's getting a little bit messy as to what benefit they extracted from that. But with the pick that I alluded to, 33, they took Charlie Lazaro. From Melbourne's perspective, they've done really, really well out of this. Obviously, they were a team in contention this year. They won the whole bloody 
bloody flag. And Ben Brown played a small part of that. I think going forward as well, I don't think they've completely answered their key forward questions. They're just a bloody good team across the field. They've got so many avenues to goal, particularly through their medium players like Bailey Fritch. But Melbourne have done very, very well out of this. North Melbourne's strategy was obviously to offload a player that probably didn't fit their age demographic. And I'm not really in a position to evaluate Charlie Lazaro in terms of what he's going to be like as a long-term player. That's all yet to unfold. But in the short term, Melbourne have got a premiership out of it. Maybe they would have won without him anyway, but I think they'll be very, very happy with this trade. North Melbourne finished last and probably don't really miss having Ben Brown anyway. Had they been a team maybe on the fringes of the eight or even, you know, pushing for top four, this would burn a lot harder. So while I think Melbourne probably win this trade on face value so far, I don't think North will be losing too much sleep over it. Next, we'll touch on Essendon again, and this team really featured heavily in last year's trade period, didn't it? They recruited Nick Hind and pick 77 for 67 and 74, so more or less collected him for chump change. He was one of the recruits of the offseason, considering what was paid for him. He's finally been able to find his niche as a small running defender, providing great line-breaking speed and meters gain generally, and then also as a high half forward for them. So I think Hind's form this year speaks for itself. He's probably in the top handful of improved players across the league, and Essendon have really, really done well here. This one will burn the Saints, I think, a little bit considering they're a team that wants to be playing finals. They missed out this year. And all in all, Essendon really were massive winners this trade period, you'd have to say, at least looking at it one year on, with taking three top 10 picks and some pretty good money ball selections in Peter Wright and Nick Hind. Next, we'll take a look at the Jaden Stevenson trade. He, along with Artu Bozanovalagi and pick 39, left Collingwood for picks 26, 33, and 70. Again, this was a salary dump on the behalf of the Magpies here, so it's hard for them to win this whenever you're trading plays out for salary purposes, generally on face value, you lose the trade because you're also acquiring that salary cap space. I would argue Stevenson was a pretty bright spot for the North Melbourne Footy Club this year. He's only 22 years old and statistically maybe didn't blow it out of the water this year, but he averaged 19 and a half disposals, the most he's ever averaged. He's playing a bit more as a midfielder in a team that finished last this year. So I'm pretty pleased with North Melbourne from their perspective. I think that was a really, really good calculated risk to take on Jaden Stevenson. And at times he looked really good this year. He polled three Brownlow votes against my club when they upset us here in Perth. As for R2, he managed just seven games this year. He's kind of been giving a new role as a defender and he played a fair bit of uh, VFL this year as well, but he's going to be a bit more slow and steady. With North's pick that they acquired in this, they took Phoenix Spicer, who debuted, but again, far too early to evaluate exactly what they got out of that. What did Collingwood get out of this? Well, it gets a little bit messy because picks get traded around and I believe it helped them acquire Reith McInnes through matching an academy bid and then they drafted Liam McMahon. So in the short term, I think just on the basis of Jaden Stevenson, I think North have done extremely well out of this. I know the Pies fans are extremely bullish on Reith McInnes. I don't know too much about Liam McMahon, but it's one of those ones that could in the long term work out really well for Collingwood, but on face value so far, I'd rather be North in this scenario. Next, we'll take a look at Orazio Fantasia, who left Essendon along with pick 73 for pick 29 and a 2021 third rounder. Now, looking back through the draft, I'm not too sure what ended up happening with pick 29. I know that Essendon didn't take a pick around that range, so they must have untraded, I suppose. I'm sure somebody in the comments can illuminate me as to what happened there. In terms of Fantasia, he had a pretty injury interrupted year. He managed 15 games, but he averaged two goals a game, kicked four in a big final. So I think from a poor perspective, he well and truly ticked the box for them. It's hard to be too critical on Essendon because he's a player that wanted out. So what do you do when a player really doesn't want to play for your club? And on the whole, they were still very productive. So I think Port's definitely done better in this trade in isolation, but I don't think Essendon's really losing too much sleep over it. And there's still a third rounder in this year's draft to consider as well. So if Essendon nailed that, then they'll be pretty happy with it. Starting to move into some of the more high profile trades of the trade period. Adam Trelaw obviously left Collingwood last year along with picks 26, 33, and 42. And they received pick 14 and a second rounder in this upcoming draft. It was another salary cap dump for the Collingwood Pies and they kind of lose by default in that regard. Trelaw did have a pretty solid year for the for the dogs. He probably wasn't at his absolute best. I think they messed with his role a little bit, which isn't a massive surprise considering how strong that Bulldogs midfield is. But when he played his role, he was very, very good. And you would have seen in the grand final, he stood up in some big moments, had three goals and 27 possessions. The dogs were also able to use the picks they acquired in 
this trade to match a bid for Jamara Ugal Hagen. So on the whole, they are definitely up in this trade. Having said that, given that Collingwood have pretty much embraced the strategy of heading to the draft and more or less completely rebuilding their list, Adam Trudeau is probably not a player that they really need right now. And they were criticized a lot for the PR side of things. And I think those criticisms are valid, but they did pick up Oliver Henry with the draft pick that they got for him. And if he turns out to be a good long-term player for them, they've actually turned this into perhaps potentially a win-win. It's hard to give any points to Collingwood here though, because they were doing a salary cap dump, they definitely got unders for Trelaw. If Oliver Henry ends up being a gem, that's through some, a bit of luck to be honest with pick 17. But given their current age profile, I think it's good that they have Oliver Henry on their list. And it's also worth mentioning that the 2021 second rounder, if they've still got it, would likely help them a match a bid for Nick Dacos. Let's talk about Jeremy Cameron, definitely the biggest name to move clubs last year. He left the GWS Giants along with two second rounders in this upcoming draft for picks 13, 15 and 20 last year and a fourth rounder in this year's draft. I think Jeremy Cameron was pretty solid this year. He only played 15 games because he couldn't quite get his body right, but he added 39 goals and I think more or less ticked the box for what Geelong was hoping to get out of him this year. Obviously, they were gearing up for a flag, but that's not really Jeremy Cameron's fault. I think his output was solid and at times Geelong looked very, very dangerous with a front three of Hawkins, Cameron and Rowan. And I also wouldn't underrate the value of having two extra second rounders in this year's draft too. On the GWS side of things, they would definitely love to have Jeremy Cameron still on their list, but they did take Tanner Brun, Connor Stone and Ryan Angwin with the three first rounders last year. The first two in particular could end up being gems, so they might actually do very, very well out of this trade. On the negative side of things for the Giants, you do have to wonder about the flow on effect of yet another star player requesting a trade. He's probably the best player to leave the Giants in their history. Obviously, you don't want to build a culture where it's normal to leave the Giants as well. So there's all those sort of flow on effects, but there's a chance this ends up a win-win if the Giants have nailed those picks. And finally, we'll talk about the high profile move of Joe Danaher from the Essendon Footy Club to the Brisbane Lions. This one was a free agency move, so not technically a trade, but Essendon did get compensation of pick nine for this deal. Danaher had a pretty solid and consistent season, didn't really blow it out of the water, but he kicked 46 goals from 24 games and from memory may have scored in every single home and away game. I think he's still a very, very important recruit for the Lions. He was so structurally important and this year they had some injuries uh, in particular with Hipwood going down, which would have been more dire had they not had Danaher and then McStay again in the finals as well. But they're a team that's going to be contending for the next four years, at least in my opinion, and Danaher is still the right age to help them try and get some success. On the Essendon side of things, they took Archie Perkins with pick nine and he's a pretty well-respected player in terms of the upside and the talent that that kid has. He showed signs of that immense talent at AFL level this year, but he's obviously still far from a guarantee. So far, so good for Essendon, I would say. At the end of the day, Danaher didn't want to play for them. He was a free agent, and they extracted fair value from that deal. In fact, some would say pick nine for Danaher in terms of his ability at the time and his exposed form was probably over. So I'm inclined to say so far, it's a win-win, but obviously it much depends on how Archie Perkins goes as a player. So there you have it, guys. That is my little analysis of 12 months on from what was a pretty tumultuous trade period last year. A lot of big names moving. I'm not sure if we're going to see the same level of high profile players swapping clubs this year, but you never know. As always, I invite you to let me know in the comments what you agree with or disagree with in the comments below. I really enjoy talking about trade and stuff and I know that everyone does and I think the views and interaction around these trade period videos do suggest that. So by all means, if you have something to say, let us know in the comments. If you enjoyed this format of video, guys, make sure you let me know as well because I'm planning on maybe going back to 2019 and you know, if you guys are responding to this, I'll go back even further because um, it's kind of a quite a fun analysis. But for now, thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.